Right, we're here to talk to you um, about the readability guidelines, what they are, why we need them, and how you can help. Has anybody heard of the readability guidelines? Oh, Brilliant. you're amazing. Oh, hello. <laughs> hello. Um, <clears throat> for those of you who haven't, so this all started a few months ago. When we get organisations who come to us for content advice, often they will ask us to produce a style guide for them. How many of you have seen an editorial style guide? Okay, good. So you know what those sorts of things are, right? And <clears throat> every time they come to me, I'm kind of like, you want me to invent the wheel, basically. You kind of want me to start this from scratch. I normally send them here. It's a WK style guide. Me and the team did this originally. It has been tested to death, right? <laughs> It's been lab tested. It was uh, academically researched by the University of Reading. Um, <clears throat> If I could have tested any element in that, I did, because it kind of needed to be bulletproof. At that time, government um, used to have the most incredible arguments about the tiniest, tiniest things. One of the things that actually tipped me over the edge to leaving GDS was that after we had changed the way the government communicated, we'd brought 482 sites into one after we'd taken the original 26 across over 75,000 items in six months. I was still spending two hours a week arguing with people about whether to cap up the word government. Could that be lowercase, like The Guardian? Should it be uppercase, like The Times? And I'd had enough. Um, <clears throat> because from a usability perspective, nobody cares. Nobody was tripping over this. This was not impairing understanding. Right, with a lot of reading, it is what you're familiar with, which will help you pass very quickly over the text. But it doesn't impair your understanding for a lot of these style points. So <clears throat> this is a sort of thing that you would find. Caps is the biggest bane of most content people's lives. It's like departments want to cap every word going. And if it's important, like agenda, or program, or any other word. They'll just put caps every five seconds. There is actually research that shows if you cap everything and title case can slow people down. But the problem is, a lot of this research was done in the 1970s. So it's very different to how we understand language now. The other argument that we have a lot around star guides is about how language moves and how language changes. We do not speak in the way Chaucer did, right? I am not speaking to you like Shakespeare right now. So language changes, language moves on, but a lot of people don't move with it, and their style guides will keep them steeped back in the 1950s. So my solution to this, and everybody keep creating style guides every five seconds, was to just stop doing it. Can we just stop doing this? Just go to GovUK, it's been researched to death, just use that. But a lot of people won't, because it's too government. And they don't trust it, because it's not this university, or it's not that health trust, or it's not that private company. So they don't trust it, which is no good. Style can be entirely based on usability, I think. But you can have very empty style. And in which case, I think you have two decisions to make. If it's an empty style decision, carry on. It doesn't matter. If it doesn't impair usability, off you go. Do whatever you like, whatever makes you happy. But if it impairs usability, and obviously from that, if you saw my last thing, you would know that accessibility is usability, then I think we should have some standards. And I don't think we need to reinvent the wheel every five seconds. WCAG guidelines are doing very well in this area. We have loads of uh, reports coming out. We need to start pulling these things together. And as content people, we need to stop wasting our time arguing about these things all the time. So for example, when it comes to things like link text, we say, be action orientated. Because it gives the idea to the user about what is going to happen to them afterwards. It's a usability consideration. It's an accessibility consideration. That's not really a style thing. But loads of people will still think it is. 
So you've seen before, accessibility for us and usability is the same thing. If you can't access it, you can't use it. If you can't use it, it's not usable. Therefore, why is it there in the first place? So the usability guidelines are an attempt <coughs> to define style guidance to make content readable by everyone. And we really mean that. <coughs> Using your content to get across to people is usually the fastest way to do it. If you have somebody helping you read a screen or just access it or maybe English is a second language or whatever, they will benefit from short sentences that everybody understands. In the same way as if you're a specialist, you're a high court judge and you've got stacks to read about a thing. You don't want to be spending a long time on this. And empty style decisions can slow you down. So <clears throat> we're looking for this to be tools for our mission to make all content inclusive by design, which obviously in this room, I'm preaching to the converted. So this is awesome. Um, <clears throat> So what we're doing is a, a project that's collaborative. And by collaborative, I mean actually collaborative. I don't mean collaborative in that I'm going to do a thing and hurl it over the fence to you. You're going to put loads of comments in track changes in Word, and then you're going to hurl it back. No. This is a global collaboration project. So we are working with people in South Africa, Indonesia, America, New Zealand, Canada. New Zealand Ireland, everywhere. Um, the main purpose is that it is inclusive design centric. Now for us, we're content people, we're steeped in that, that's fine, there's always something new to learn, but we're not experts. And we're not experts in every disability or impairment or access need either. Everything that we do needs to be evidence based. Everybody's got an opinion, haven't they? And everybody is quite happy to proffer an opinion at me, usually, which is very nice, but that doesn't help me. What this project is about is to stop content people having these arguments. In order to do that, we need evidence. Um, <clears throat> it's also pretty ambitious, because loads of people are going, you're doing what now? Globally? Really? We're going to start it in English, and then we're hoping to translate as well and do it multilingual. Um, and it is cross-sector. So we have people from universities, we have people from private sector, third, public sector, everything that <laughs> Alistair said a bit earlier. The idea is, if the more sectors get involved and more sectors trust it, people sitting in little niche audiences will go, well, everybody else is doing this, and here is all the evidence, and here is all the guidance, and so there are fewer arguments to be had. <clears throat> So it's already live, it's here. We're going to be um, tweeting out this uh, every five seconds for the next three days. <laughs> We're gonna use it on, um, you've also had it tweeted out by Alistair, et cetera. So it's there, it's already up, it's already live. Um, <clears throat> we've got over this now 359 people in Slack. Most of them are very quiet. They lurk. <laughs> There's a lurker right there. Um, <coughs> And I get loads of DMs, loads of personal messages on all sorts of channels going, this is amazing! But nobody actually speaks. <laughs> There's probably about 15 people who actually speak. We have weekly discussions on Slack that allows that global collaboration thing to happen. And we have over 50 points of evidence now. And when I say a point of evidence, I mean an empirical study, not somebody's opinion. We're talking about actual studies. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Project, so that we've already done an alpha, which was kind of like, is this going to work? Should we bother with this? Would content people find it useful? The answer was yes. So we asked for volunteers to lead uh, live weekly discussions on individual points. So we asked for super contributors, and they take a point like N rules and M dashes, because we geek hack on that sort of thing, uh, whether caps are a good idea or not, using ampersands, that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> we asked them to lead on that. We asked them to lead the rest of the world, um, in this little group, by the way, not in general, <laughs> with a kind of global collaboration on gathering data and evidence, finding anecdotal evidence is still important because it might lead us to empirical evidence. Um, and then they talk about it weekly. Okay? So crucially, we're asking questions about inclusivity and that's where you come in, right? Um, because we have tried to answer these questions, and we have lots of them, 
and we need the evidence to know what is right to recommend, and you will know that, because particularly people, ex experts in accessibility, we need that from you to convince the stakeholders to accept this guidance, because that's actually what we as content people need. We need to have those internal conversations, and we need you to help us get that evidence and those kind of guidelines and get those guidelines sorted out. So, we have questions, lots and lots of questions, and this is where you need to start talking. Um, yeah, so we're going to turn the tables a bit with the Q&A formats and ask the audience. Um, so, please do um, raise your hand if, if you can help us answer these. Um, so, uh, one of the things we're looking at is how do a wide range of screen readers pass ampersands, dashes and hyphens, other punctuation that conveys meaning or adds nuance like brackets. Um, Has anybody so got any ideas <laughs> that they want to share? Oh, oh, I feel like Annika Rice. Does anybody remember or are you too young? I hate you all. <laughs> I think, um, sorry, it's Catherine uh, from the BBC. I think that it'll depend a lot on the screen reader and browser combination that you're using as to whether it announces anything or doesn't recognise it, such as for a dash and a hyphen. Yep. I think it would depend on the platform or the assistive technology that you're using. So some might recognise a dash, some might not acknowledge it at all. So as, as an expert... What would you say that we could use in content that would get over that? I always use a comma. Oh. That creates a pause. Mm. Depends on the situation and what it's for, but the only thing that I've tested consistently across all this technology that we support in um, BBC News is yep. a comma. Mm. That creates a pause. Okay. But it depends if you're looking for the pause. That, yeah. that does... Um, that does tie in with some of the um, initial research that we've looked at. It is looking like a comma would be best. So, But having said that, um, in the testing that I did, um, I was often in visually hidden text or off-screen text. And obviously, if the copy is displayed on screen as well, then a comma might not look appropriate. Yeah, and if you have two sub clauses to a sentence and you're using a bracket and comma, it, it could get ugly. At which point, maybe you need to have two simpler sentences. Exactly. So it could become a content design thing. Content people are really happy right now. The rest <laughs> of you are looking a little bit worried. Right, I'm telling you, if you've got two subclauses to a sentence and you're using bracketing parentheses, it can get very ugly very quickly. Thank you. Lovely. <laughs> are there any other comments on this one? So I've got a quick comment there as well. Ooh. So could you also... <laughs> It depends a lot on the user setting, so screen readers are incredibly configurable. Um, some people will use the default setting, some people will configure it. Um, also, um, screen readers allow people to kind of deep dive into the content. If they've heard something and it's not made sense, they can go back and listen to the characters or the word or the sentence again. Um, okay. So users can interrogate the content if they know how to. How many of them are likely to know how to? Um, I don't know, that uh, perhaps question for the RNIB possibly. Um, okay. Yeah, um, got to. Alistair wants to run, that's what that was. Ah. <laughs> so, Shilpi Kapoor from Barrier Break. Uh, one of the things I think you should consider because it's readability guidelines is that it's not only about the screen reader, nope. uh, but also about other reading tools. Uh, we have other questions. Perfect. <laughs> but to Alistair's point, most of them would uh, be able to configure the different settings yep. uh, and most of them would actually not only configure that one of the biggest problems that we're finding is when these things are also used under other technologies let's say it's MathML right yep. and if you've got math and you've got an open bracket cl close bracket yeah so most of the time people only look at things which are at basic content level but there is so much of other content which has been created which is just not textual content Okay. Right. Um, so that might be something to also look at because those tools then read it out differently along with the screen reader. Ah. So like a curly bracket versus yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, a rounded bracket versus a square bracket. Yeah. How does MathML with Microsoft Word with 
uh, JAWS or NVDA actually better, read that out. So that's something to consider, a combination of tools. Would we say, we are meaning you, would you say <laughs> that actually if we just use low punctuation and we just stuck with commas and full stops, we could get across most of these problems? No. Okay, why? Um, so the kind of content that we see created on the web is very, very different. Yeah. Uh, for example, let's say you've got a balance sheet mm -hmm. uh, and it's got 2016-17. Yeah. You have no option that. but to write it like that, right? So um, content is a lot more trickier than just words. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you just, just picking up on that last point there certainly when I'm writing emails it's kind of since I kind of learned that uh, screen readers and, and other situ thing, systems don't necessarily read out the punctuation so if I'm writing you know I can meet between the 7th and the 9th of May I won't write a dash I would actually write to Two. or and instead so that I know the screen reader will read it out that so, is that is the common guidance is to do yeah. that but when you are in a spreadsheet sometimes people are saying there's not enough space but i agree mm. that the the guidance that we have at the moment is never to use it in sentences and to have to or and or between or whatever because at least hello so i'm just going to run up there and then i'm going to come back <clears throat> That's yeah, um, I work for government departments and we haven't got any accessibility guidance at all. Well, we've got very little and we're getting together. There's so many different strands we found about accessibility um, and one section is doing one bit, one bit's doing another bit. And so I've got a meeting next two weeks' time where we're going to try and bring it all together. And we have several issues in terms of like, you know, ambassades, dashes and stuff yeah. like that. And what we do... What we're thinking of doing is becoming prescriptive and saying, um, some people say, look, um, we don't have that many people with disabilities. What I'm saying is out of 7,000, we've got about 500, which is still, you know, it's, in figures is quite a lot, but we have to think about them, you know, in yeah. terms of like, not everyone is content, you know, is savvy with their screen readers or not yeah. savvy with their keyboards and stuff like that. So going what, depends what the, the scenario is, yeah, spreadsheets, and no, I haven't even touched that yet. I don't even, I know it's a mad box of fogs and things like yeah. that. But with regards to like full stops and dashes, I think you have to have a base denominator. Otherwise, you know, you can't assume that everyone's going to be savvy with their, with their um, yeah. software. And that's how we're trying to approach it. And we're, but we're getting a lot of pushback from it at the moment. You know, um, like the business needs over the user needs. And, oh. and, uh, and, uh, and it's, uh, it's a big book bear, but. I, I, I can see where they're coming from, but um, I think the biggest problem, I should say that lady down there in the front side, is spreadsheets, and I don't know how to get around that bit. Thank you. Um, well, I haven't seen many spreadsheets being done well on the internet, whether you have any access needs or not, really. Uh, who had their hand up? Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Julie. I'm a front end developer. Um, so I come from a background where we use a lot of assistive text mm -hmm. and using various uh, key, ele key elements to say, don't read this, don't read that. And, but I'm kind of, it's the first time I've heard about brackets being ignored and I don't know why I don't know this because I really should, but I'm sort of, just as a suggestion, um, you know, in terms of future proofing this, is there a type of way that certain types of brackets could signify certain types of content? So for instance, when I'm declaring a type of image to describe the type of image, I generally use a square bracket and yeah. say photo and then yeah. in the square bracket and then add in a description of whatever it is that I'm seeing. So. Uh, just as a way of suggesting that certain types of punctuation can actually mean something to the to the screen reader, yeah. and is there a possibility that screen readers are collaborating so that their systems of interpreting text actually is cohesive, just like we had with uh, W three standards, you know, yeah. and 
JavaScript followed and so forth. That would be amazing. Um, not sure it will happen anytime soon, but that would be amazing. <laughs> that would make our lives so much easier. Is it I happening? I think it, it does go back to that thing that users want, like not every user wants to hear every bit of punctuation <coughs> announced. That's why you can turn them off or turn them on. Yeah, um, I see. So it's probably more down to how it's set. If somebody wants to turn on all punctuation, they could have that turned on and they could, mm -hmm. they, they could hear it all. But that would be so verbose, they probably wouldn't appreciate it or want it. OK, is there any more on that? Oh, hello. Uh, hi, my name's Ian, QA. And uh, I'm a big fan of semicolons. Uh -huh. <laughs> I think they should play a more prominent role than okay. they do. Um, I'm actually a real beginner to accessibility. I'm here to learn uh, more than anything. But I did recently uh, read the Collins uh, Guide to English Grammar, mm -hmm. just for fun. Because <laughs> that's what QAs are like. Um, but, do you um, need to get out more, sir? I don't know. <laughs> I read it in I'm the park. <laughs> Uh, but the, uh, one of the things that I picked up which is really interesting, obviously they go into a lot of detail about the minutiae of, uh, uh, of, of use of special characters in this way and what the real meaning of them are. And the, the bit that I picked out was, um, while we can't necessarily rely on going to low grammar uh, in that sense, uh, there is a general drive in that direction. And I think, to me, it was uh, largely due to consistency as, as um, our language becomes more centralised due to communication. And that the usage of different specific types uh, of uh, punctuation um, are be beginning to trend towards more, more general agreed usage. And that that actually helps our cause and accessibility. Yeah, I think, I think you're quite right. I think as language changes, thank you, um, things are being dropped out of the curriculum. So how many of you got children? Uh, if your kids are in primary or indeed in, in sort of middle school, are they taught the difference between an M dash and an N rule? Nope. So the question might be, whilst it makes me cry inside, my daughter who got a nine, which is the highest you can get in English, was looking at me going, Mum, shut up, no one cares. Do you see what I mean? It's exactly to your point, right? Language is moving on and we seem to be simplifying it. And a lot of reading um, is uh, pathological. You can't control it. I think I did it last time, didn't I? You'll all need to watch the video <laughs> to see, won't you? Um, so a, a lot of it is pathological and a lot of it is, is about familiarity. And so it kind of depends on how fast we run. Do we want to keep up with... Uh, certain age ranges? Do we want to move with language as soon as our language moves? Or do we want to wait five years and kind of be behind it so that we've got everybody at the same time? I don't know. If you come up with the answer, answers on a postcard, please. Thank you. Okay, so that's question one. We've got loads of these. Yeah. You ready? <laughs> I just wanted to quickly jump in and say um, about the settings and the, the comma point because what's really great about the comma is that it doesn't read out comma as I understand it, it pauses. So wouldn't it be great if instead of reading out brackets or whatever, the screen reader um, mirrored natural speech a bit more and you know if we're, if we're talking we wouldn't say brackets this and if it could say act as natural speech would. I don't know whether any of them do that, but... Um. Yeah, I'm not sure. But equally, if someone's listening to something at 300 words Speak, per minute, yeah. they probably wouldn't pick up that right. subtlety anyway. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. great. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Um, on to the next Question one. Two. <coughs> Technical hitch. Just press down. No. The I'm pressing down. I pressed that. Oh, sides. No, just the one question for you today. Thanks very much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It did turn itself off for a bit. It went blank. Just while they're doing this, this is, this is the level of conversation that content people have to have regularly. Content people 
who put up your hands earlier, don't you have to go through some of this crap at some Thank time? You. <laughs> yeah. What we'd like to be able to do is concentrate on the bigger picture. Why are you publishing this at all? It's on the wrong channel, whatever. We'd like to be doing that, but we're not. We're arguing about this stuff. This is why we'd like your help, so that we can stop doing this. Um, so the next question, are um, positive and possessive, so we've had evidence, um, sh a usability study showing that negative um, contractions do pose um, usability issues, but we haven't yet got any evidence about positive and possessive contractions. So you know when people write will and then they go, um, will not, and then you put it to won't or cannot and you put it to can't, that's a contraction. So we're asking, are positive and possessive contractions readable for users with um, low literacy, dyslexia, low vision or learning difficulties? Does anyone happen to know anything you about know, that? Off the top of your heads. What we found is particularly um, people with English as a second language, they can read will not and understand will not far faster than they can won't. Because English is quite a difficult language for some other languages to pick up. A language is considered a working language at 3,000 terms. With English, you have to learn that and then some just to hold a conversation. It is the same with a lot of other languages, but not all. So again, depending on what language you have and which ones you come in at, um, the will, will not, won't thing is really tricky because what you're actually doing is just asking them to understand another family of terms, which is not quite usual. So we're asking you, do you know if that kind of contraction, does that get in the way of anybody or do we not know? So I've certainly heard a number of user researchers uh, within central government finding people with low literacy struggling with negative contractions. Yep. With negative, how about positive ones? <coughs> oh, I have never heard that mm. discussed. Yeah. It's interesting. Oh, hello. As a non native speaker, um, I do find, or I remember finding, or I, I've heard people, non natives like me, struggling with the specifically we want and specifically when it's written because mm. it looks like something different. Mm. It looks okay. like, and when, when you hear it, it looks like I want something, and it just you know, ah. freaks you out. Um, <laughs> but and when it's written, it just looks like something that you've never seen before. But um, from my experience, and people like my age and literacy, level literacy can't, for example, or um, yep. what's the other example? Like the possessive contractions are there, they are. Yeah. They are pretty easy. Because, okay. and I find that it's easier for us than from, for English speakers because yeah, yeah. we study much more grammar at school. Mm, yeah. So for me, I'm never going to be confused between they are, there, and yeah. they're, there as the adjective. Okay. I, it's, it's harder to say than to write. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's my experience and I, that's what I find among people in European middle educated yeah. kind of thing. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right, that's one to look into. Just one at the back. Oh, are you running? Excellent. <laughs> Sorry, this is um, less of a, an answer and more of a question. Um, <laughs> We're asking quite, you this the is all questions. Quite, this is all quite new to me. <laughs> but um, the, uh, my only question would be, and obviously um, I feel like having the most people understand something is, is much more important than this. But there is, with something like can't and cannot, yep. I always feel like there's a, there's a question of emphasis. Um, and do, is, there ever, is there ever kind of a conflict of interest in, in that? Uh, and I suppose, I mean, I'm kind of thinking that understanding is much more important than misread emphasis. But then uh, I know for some disabilities, the comprehension can be um, can be difficult with different types of emphases, and I know that I definitely read can't and cannot differently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there was a study done, um, and uh, it was around the perception of must, could, should, and what was the other one? I'm looking for help. I don't know. There were some others. <laughs> um, uh, <clears throat> 
in government and must was the one that people thought they would end up in jail with if they didn't do it and should and could meant that you could probably fudge it a bit and get round your judge. So, um, so in terms of using that sort of language, you can use emphasis in a different way, um, but it is very difficult with this contraction business because a lot of people will say it's our tone and style to be friendly and happy and all these things and it's like that's lovely is it usable because you can muck around with your tone and style without using usability and that's the balance that we're looking for thank you thank you shall i go to the next yep probably only got a few minutes to okay. break sorry. Um, sorry so this was one of we had a we discussed this in the chat on Slack last week. Um, does, any, does having a link mid-sentence impair readability? Like we had people say maybe it will distract you, you might go off, exit the page, um, might slow down the reading because it's going to be a slightly different style. Um, what do you think? So you know when we used to have all the sentence and then the link at the end of the paragraph? Do you remember that time of the internet? Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> it used to happen, I promise. Um, and then we all just well, start link text all the way through. One of the things in government, actually, at Direct Gov and then Gov UK, was that um, we needed people to read a certain amount before we had them disappear because we needed them to understand a thing and it was quite complex stuff because we weren't where we are now. Um, and so there was an idea that putting the link at the end meant that you are more likely, more likely, not definite, to read the whole thing before you disappear. But what we're wondering is, are there any access needs around that? If, if you had two, say you had a paragraph, eight sentences, and you've got two inline links in that text, is that going to distract you enough to make it unusable? Hello? We're just hoping for all the answers this evening. Sorry, can you, can you just pass that on? Thank you. Hi, I'm Sarah from NHS UK. It's not quite the answer you're looking for, but what we have found is that where you've got links mid-sentence yep. or throughout a paragraph, it can actually help people scan Brilliant. and find the things they want. Okay, so perfect. So we certainly find that people will actually use them as a way of scanning the page. Mm. <laughs> See, that's yeah. what we need. <laughs> Are there any other things on this? Hello? Hi, um, I am autistic and I find that when I am reading a paragraph with links in the middle of sentences, I end up rereading it repeatedly before I understand what it says. Ah, because it's pulled out and it's blue and it's underlined or whatever? I just kind of stop reading when I get to the link and then start again. <laughs> Interesting, see, oh. perfect, thank, thank you very you. much. Oh, we need to do even more research on this now, thank you. <laughs> So, knowing that we're running out of time, mm, what other questions we just, have we got? Um, yeah. So, <coughs> um, we'll just run through, uh, like read out the last questions, and if yeah, you yeah. can join the Slack channel, that would be fantastic. Um, so, uh, we were <laughs> wondering whether we should be making sort of words to avoid list and a way of testing words against a certain level of literacy. Um, wondering whether um, there's any studies about more uplift in use by um, less advantaged and minority group users when the language is more inclusive. Um, going to be discussing you and we, whether they are um, <coughs> impair the clarity of content. Um, and yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that, they're, they're the sort of questions that we get into. And I realise that some of you are looking at us going, "What are you saying?" Um, these things we find, obviously we're biased, right? We're content people, and I am absolutely going to fess up to that. But we find that this is the fastest way to get people to stop, disengage, and move away, and potentially get the wrong information. If you're government, that's not okay. If you're buying a pair of trainers, it's fine, right? You go to another shop, you buy a different pair of trainers, whatever, it doesn't matter. But with a lot of the services that we work with in law and finance, it's kind of not okay. You go wrong, you end up in jail or with a big fine. So these are the sort of nuances that we would like to be looking at. Um, good content, we say, is the fastest way to an audience understanding and acting on it because that's what we want them to do. 
So we're asking you, please, will you come and talk and not just lurk, <laughs> Lorena, um, <clears throat> in Slack, and there's an invite. So we're going to tweet all this out and, and everything. So um, maybe we'll ask you to send out an email or something with all these links on. We really, we really, really need your help. We need more evidence, we need more data. What we're looking at is if we can't find it, we're going to look at funding it to find that research because we truly believe that it really messes up the user experience. But we don't know how to do it either, so we'll probably <laughs> come to you for that as well, um, just so that we can make everything really inclusive. So thank you very much for listening, and we hope to see you on Slack very soon. <laughs>